So I'm here with artist Paul Madonna in his studio in downtown or South San Francisco. Tell me a little bit about this place. Yeah, so this is Command Central. This is really, I, I think of the studio as a workshop. Uh, it's Everything has to be in order and it's about tools. It's about uh, finishing things. So I mean, really inspiration comes from the world. Like I like to draw on site. I like to travel. I like to go out and get my stories. I mean, that's where the title All Over Coffee came from, which was I loved working in cafes just because I could draw from life. I could listen to people. I could overhear things. And, you know, that's a, you get input. But I come to the studio because everything here is controlled. You know, that's why all my tools are organized. And, and I come in here to finish work and, and uh, sort of be by myself and let my brain open up. So I first got introduced to your work through All Over Coffee, as I imagine many people, it, it was every day in the Chronicle? It, well, for the first essentially two years, it was four days a week, mm -hmm. three days in a daily and one in a Sunday. And then, um, and then I really learned a lot. I call that art boot camp because, I mean, you, I'd finish a piece, I'd turn it in at like two o'clock to go to print at four o'clock and head out to start drawing, uh, finish the next piece, do the same thing the next day, and, you know, get up in the morning and look at how it printed in the newspaper and be like, all right, well, this is how I need to adjust it. So after a couple of years, I figured out how to edit and really I, I wanted to make less pieces. So I went to one day a week and I did that for 10 more years. What I think is so incredible about it is when you're looking at it, being in the Bay Area, you're kind of like, wait, that looks familiar. What street right. is that on? Yeah. You know, and you, you're trying to kind of almost like figure out. And then also how you added text into mm -hmm. What what first got you started with adding text with the drawings? Well, interestingly, uh, more than making a drawing or even writing a piece of text, what interested me was the pairing of the two. It was how a line of text and how a drawing interacted that I was most interested in. So All Over Coffee really began as an experiment. Uh, I, I went out and I did all these drawings. I did, I think, about 12 drawings to start. And I had this um, this long-form story that I was writing and, uh, and there was like a, a subplot I was trying to shove in and I realized that plot doesn't work at all. Mm -hmm. So I pulled it out and I did what I called the David Bowie method, which is I cut up every sentence, I printed it out. And I laid all these drawings out on my table and I started putting, I put one sentence with one drawing and then sort of step back and look at it. And then I'd move it to another drawing and realized that it had a completely different power. And then I'd put three drawings in a row and put three sentences. And how does that work? Where you start to create these relationships and I realized that all these wonderful sort of feelings and emotions and sort of juxtapositions were happening that I couldn't have preconceived. And this idea that you could let creativity happen was super exciting to me. And so it just allowed me to sort of run, to draw things that I thought were beautiful, write things that I thought were interesting and see what happened when I put them together. So it's funny, I'm interested, I'm interviewing you now because I actually am quitting coffee. I quit coffee this week. <laughs> and so it's weird. I'm going to the coffee shop and I'm only ordering one coffee for my wife. And they're like, what? No two coffees? Like what's going oh, that's on? A, that's some resilience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to know, you mentioned as I was coming in here, you're getting all over coffee three. All right? over coffee three. I'm literally yeah, composing. Up. Yeah, yeah, you can grab that. Um, I mean, I'm literally building the book right now. So, cool. uh, yeah. so for those who are curious, this is how the donut is made. This is how the donut is made. I mean, it's, you know, I'm just printing out pieces, taping them together. This is the second iteration. The first is, you can see over there, it's just pages, individual pr pages printed out, which uh, just have sticky notes all over them and have different, or bundled in a different way. And I've been composing this book for probably two months. So you know, not every day, but I'll come in and I'll go through it and then move pieces around. So now I'm actually taping them together to make a mock-up uh, because we go to print in, in December on this book. But I finished this work six years ago. Yeah. So what's interesting is I've made, I've written three books since then. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've taken this work sort of off the shelf and I'm diving back into it. And what's really amazing is to, to reflect on it and sort of, I, I have such a new eye that I couldn't have had six years ago. So I brought your book with you. Oh yeah, oh, so you brought the that? second yeah. All Over Coffee book. Well, I, yeah, I brought... Uh, and, and my latest novel, yeah. So, so that's the second so, All Over Coffee. So 
Everything is its own reward. Such a good title. Thank you. Can you sign this for me? Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> that's part of the reason I, I came out here. Camera if I said no. I know. Yeah. That's okay. that's how you get people to sign things. You say, let's do the yeah. interview first, and then um, <laughs> who knows what else you're gonna do. So get I, I am a, a big fan of yours, though. I, I did, you know, buy two of your all over coffee prints. You did. You bought, well, you well you bought the originals, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Bought, um, oh, cool. That's in the frame. So I yeah. I frame them together to make it one piece. Because um, they are essentially a diptych. Exactly, yeah. And that's what I was like, oh, I need to get them both. I can't just get one, otherwise I'm going to think the whole rest of my life, where's the other one out there in the world? Yeah, well, I think I wanted to sell them together. That's yeah, a really early piece. It was, um, I mean, that might be from the first six months of the strip, uh, definitely within the first year. And it was my first sort of real, like, nighttime-ish. So when I look at it now, I see how simple it is. And, mm -hmm. and I, I don't cringe. It's more just... Um, you know what's wonderful is that I can see how far I've come. Simplicity right. is the ultimate sophistication. Well, that is true. And I think, you know, the, what I hit on with my drawing style in Oliver Coffee was I hit a certain plateau that, and this is going to sound cocky, but uh, that every piece I made was of a certain quality. I was yeah. going to say good, but that's, you know. But what I mean is um, I could play around and still feel pretty confident that there would be something evocative. Yeah. that would come out of the drawing. And um, and I think that allowed me to grow. Like We hit these moments in our life where we're like, okay, I have a certain skill set now. And everything I do is just building on that skill set. So I when I see this, I see sunrise. You said it was more around sunset. Well, it's sunset, yeah, so that's looking west. Okay. Do you know what the cross street is? Oh, well, it's California. Um, I want to say that this is uh, um, Polk Street here. So I'm standing, what, like a block or two blocks up. I'm pretty sure that's where I'm at. I mean, this is literally 2005. Yeah, no, I'm, so this I'm is, making you go to time This is like now. 16 years ago. Um, yeah, and I'm also, you know, I'm so terrible about, like, knowing which corner. Yeah. Like, people will come and buy a drawing that I did, like, a month ago, and I'm like, oh, I have to look it up. Uh, I'm like, I can tell you what part of town I was in. So do you know which one this is printed in? Oh, so that is in All Over Coffee 1. That's in the first collection. Nice. Yeah. So that would be like 2005. Very nice. I'm super proud of it. It's like right above my TV. People come in, they're like, oh, where oh, cool. is that? Yeah, I like the way you framed it. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to talk with you about your novel. Yeah. So the, that's the latest Emmett Hopper book. Yeah, it's the second book uh, called Come to Light. I'm super proud of this book. I think that... You know, I was really proud of the first one. Close Enough for the Angels was mm -hmm. the first uh, novel with, with this character, um, who is a, he, he's a fun character. Um, I mean, he's an artist and writer. I mean, it's, but he's sort of a, he, he's both a success and a failure. Like he, um, and uh, he's witty, but he, he, my joke is it's like my version of Murder, She Wrote, because he keeps finding himself in these, in these situations uh, where there are mysteries. Um, but I think with this book, I really hit on um, plot in a way that I've really been seeking with angels and that, uh, that I don't know that I did as well in that first book. I mean, I, I think that first book is sort of a hybrid of Oliver Coffee and a novel mm -hmm. because it's told in these really short chapters that sort of bounce around to create, uh, like by the end, it all fits together. But mm -hmm. it's like Oliver Coffee where I was sort of pairing this and pairing this with with Come to Light, it was a straight up, like, I'm going to write a plot-driven novel. What I think is so interesting about it is it's such a mystery in the beginning where you're like, what's going on? You can tell it's semi-autobiographical in some which it, sense. Which it isn't at all. But, it's but completely like, fictional. But there are aspects that seem very much like, you know, it's about an artist. Oh, yeah. right. Well, that's I think that's the wonderful part of, um, of you know, when you talk about write what you know. Yeah. You know, and... and Sometimes it feels like, oh, yeah, it's just a veiled, you know, but it isn't me. He's not me. But the, the thing is, is that I realized that I have a real insight. Like, I know things about plein air drawing that most people don't. So it's actually something that I can really give to the character that makes him feel real and, and creates a world unlike any author is creating because, uh, you know, I'm, I, it's like when a doctor writes a book and is a good storyteller. And there are a handful of really <laughs> good storytelling uh, uh, doctors. And, and they're able to write about medicine and practicing in, in a way that nobody else can. And that, I think that, and even in fiction, that's what we're looking for. We're looking to feel that there's a kernel of truth in there, that, or that it's a, it's a metaphor that, that somebody really understands. 
Um, what I love is it also starts out in Thailand. My wife is right. from Thailand, oh, so okay. I'm immediately just kind of like drawn in. Um, you broke it into three different yeah, books. three volumes. So I'm going to ask you, can you sign all three? Yeah, of course. And, <laughs> and I, before I sign them, I want to yeah. tell you, I did that for two reasons. Yeah, One, yeah. each volume has a different set of drawings in oh. and a different style of drawings. So that was really fun to do here because um, the, the drawings take place as the story is going along. So these aren't your classic, like, Oh, you turn on page and somebody, and it says, you know, there's a couple sitting mm -hmm. at a cafe in Paris having a romantic dinner, and you turn a page and there's the Eiffel Tower, a glass of champagne, and it's sunset, right? That to me is is redundant because the text already told us that. So why do we want to see a picture mm -hmm. of it? Here, the drawings we're seeing are what Emmett are making, the drawings that Emmett is making as he's traveling along. So one of the things I was able to do with this book is. I, I went and traveled and made these drawings mm -hmm. as I was writing, but I knew the story I was telling. So I changed the drawings given the situation that he would be in in the story. Ah. So when he's in really stressful situations and things start to break down, his drawings start to break down and they get really sketchy. And, and so, and, um, and then he sort of, when he gets settled and putting things back together, he does these finished drawings. Also the second volume, the entire second volume is um, drawings of sculptures made by a local artist, Diane Hoffman. Mm -hmm. So I went to her and I said, uh, there's going to be a character in the book who makes sculptures. And here's his basic situation. And actually, Diane and I worked together to, this is a really cool one. Yeah. This is beautiful, I think. Um, and and, uh, and so she, she helped me sort of sculpt who this character was. Mm -hmm. She made the work and then I drew it. So in this section, uh, in this volume, Emmett is in this place where he's drawing these objects. Mm -hmm. So it was a way to sort of step out of myself, and it's providing a reader with something really different. We never talk about any of the specific sculptures, yeah. but we know that they're there in the villa, and, and really what we're learning is the story of the person who made them. Mm -hmm. So then we begin to understand them, and then we understand why he made them. So then the second reason that I wanted it to be three volumes was, I just the first book was such a tome. Close Enough for the Angels was huge. It was one of those books like, like, even reading it home in bed, it just feels like a lot. Like, and I'm the type of reader that I want to throw a book in my bag and take it with me everywhere I go. Yeah. Standing in line at the post office for five minutes, I'm going to read a chapter. Yeah. Um, and these are such like travel stories. Like he's traveling everywhere, and I'm like, I want people to be able to throw this book in their bag, right? And so mm -hmm. I want it to be, uh, you know, portable. And then it was just fun to design three separate books. <laughs> what I think really draws me to it is the drawings, though, because normally I'm like an audiobook guy, okay. and I listen while I drive and this and that. But with this, I was like, I need to buy these because I need to see the drawing mm -hmm. to really understand. And I'm curious to know whether you will make a full-on graphic novel one day, or if that's something that you're you think that it's should be, you know, clearly novelization or or well, they're know. just they're t completely different animals. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I like that you that you know that there's a difference, you know, and, and uh, I don't fault people who don't, but I, I think that it's just genre-wise, people just assume, oh, if there's a picture in the book, then it's a, it's a graphic novel. But as you know, graphic novels really come out of being comic books. They're mm -hmm. adult comic books, and, and they're robust, and they're amazing storytelling, but it's picture storytelling, which is really different than prose storytelling. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I have, or I'm just not going in that direction. Yeah. Um, who, who the hell knows? I could, I could end up there. Um, it's not what I'm interested in pursuing at the moment, but you never know. I, it just seems like a perfect blend. It's you know, for me, I always think a graphic novel is so cinematic, and yeah. all of your drawings are super cinematic. And so I was like, oh, and he could write stories too. So I'm like, right. it's gonna happen eventually. The the boot will eventually fall. And I think we'll look back at this video in like ten years, <laughs> and you'll be like, I knew it. I yeah. saw it coming. And, and you'll switch back from tequila to whiskey. And, um, so <laughs> I'll be sober up for a while. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the studio because yeah. when I first imagine a studio, I imagine you have one surface to draw on, mm. and you have many different surfaces that have different things going on. So can we kind of go yeah. around the room? I'm I'm a surface fanatic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. On, I have, I, I mean, everything is a surface. There's probably more square footage just in the surface than, I mean, there, there definitely is, than there is just in the space. Mm -hmm. um, also, this table, which, I mean, there's stuff on, so we can't do it, but yeah. this is, uh, this table moves up, up and, and down. down. Also, um, I designed this table, which also moves up and down, so that it allows me to stand and work, mm -hmm. or I can lower it, uh, because, and it allows me to make 
almost eight foot drawings mm -hmm. underneath this table. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I do is, I mean, I have a drawing table in here right now, but you can see that there are board, this whole wall is full of drawing boards. Um, so I stretch my own paper and then the larger, the small ones I'll just work on here, but the larger ones I just, I will mount to this table while I'm working on them. And that allows me to be able to move it up and down to, I can put it straight up, get some distance on it and be able to see it. So uh, another thing too, is that everything can move in a studio. Mm -hmm. Like the, the studio didn't look this way six weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and it didn't look the way it did six weeks before that. I'm always tinkering with it. And some of it is dependent on the project that I'm working on mm -hmm. because uh, I just finished a huge a 40 foot mural for SFO. Yeah. Um, and that installs next week. It's exciting, congratulations. It, thank you, yeah, it's a, it's a feather in my cap. I've been wanting to do mm -hmm. a big piece for the Art Commission and for SFO for a long time. The originals for that, I made six drawings of at five feet. So, and at one point I had all of those drawings, I was working on them all at once. So that's 30 feet of drawing uh, on six different boards, but they, they all interconnect. So I had to be aware of them. So, you know, I set up the studio so I could have those boards in my, my visual, you mm -hmm. know, at, at all times. So. You know, if you notice, pretty much everything's on wheels as well. Yeah. So that allows this space to open up or condense, depending on, on what I'm working on as well. Um, you also mentioned earlier when I first came in about the lighting. Can you tell me a little bit about lighting? Yeah, so um, it's funny because I get amazing, not today because it's a great day, but <laughs> otherwise I get amazing afternoon light in yeah. here. But I'll often close the, the curtains because uh, I like to control the lighting. You know, when I'm out in the world, my drawings are all about the light. You know, it's a scouting early in the morning or late in the afternoon, well, especially a couple of days ago, we had beautiful sunsets or something like this, right? Like you have the piece you own, there's that sense of light hitting these windows. Like that's what I think makes, or, you know, and this is a printout, but this, you know, the sense of light. Um, it's funny. I almost see this one as sunset and this one as sunrise, you know? <laughs> I mean, we could, it's like, a, yeah, it's a film. I have, mm -hmm. uh, so... Um, but, you know, again, it's the difference of being out in the world and being inspired and coming back to the studio where everything is controlled because mm -hmm. I want to be able to look at the drawing the same way at 10 a.m. as I do at 4 p.m. as I do at 10 p.m. So, um, yeah, the lights are all, they all have natural, like, uh, sunlight bulbs in there mm -hmm. so that um, when I'm looking at the piece, it, it's resonating in the ways if I were standing out in the world. Mm -hmm. I also notice you have a skeleton. I do, and it's actually a real skeleton which is hard to find. And it's like, I can't remember, something like 60 years old. Um, does it ever move? It does not move, although he's falling apart and I need, him, <laughs> I need to put him back together. Um, a friend of mine who I will, he'll remain nameless for the, for the sake of legality. Yeah. Apparently the story is, is that his, when he was in college, his uh -huh. roommate stole it from an art department. Oh, okay. And it's been in like his, his so you're storage. Say from the mortgage for <laughs> right. I mean, it's been in his storage for literally decades, and finally, I was like, "Dude, it's just in your storage. You know, let me use it." So I yeah. need to. I just got him recently. Um, got to clean him up and have put you, him back together. Have you named him? No, I haven't named him. I've just been referring to him as Mr. Bones, but Mr. that's Bones, pretty yeah. uncreative. Yeah. Um, but what's cool is I, you know, I really I draw from life, and mm -hmm. I, I studied I started studying figure drawing when I was 15. I was doing uh, pre college classes while I was in high school, so um, I really got introduced to to that form of education early on, and um, and you know I have worked from fake skeletons. And what's interesting is even if they're created from molds, they've been poured so many times. Like it's hard to, like you can't really tell texture or the mm. features. And I really, I, so I've been in search of a real skeleton for a long time because you can go up and see, you know, the, the porousness of the bones and, and, and all those shapes are natural shapes or they have a crispness to them that, um, that fake skeletons don't. And it's that sort of stuff that I really respond to. I mean, even in my drawings, we talk about simplicity, but you know, texture, I love texture. Mm -hmm. Like I, there's, there's a drawing right there, like drawing those rocks and the bricks. Yeah. You know, I didn't have to put the, I mean, I love the composition mm -hmm. of it, but I really enjoy drawing those. The reflections on that window. Oh or, yeah. Or even, you know, the, the, the holes. Force. Yeah, and like that's the stuff that really turns me on because I can create uh, texture with, with just with marks and figuring out what type of mark making to do to indicate that for the, the eye and the brain is really, really fun for me. So, um, you know, we might think of the skeleton as, oh, drawing the form and understand the way that anatomy works, but I'm also thinking about it as, 
really like how how is that edge shaped and where is it sort of brittle and and, and you know where are the bones rubbing against each other um in addition to sfo who who are some of your biggest uh people who commission work oh um well i rather than name individuals because i'm not sure i want to uh -huh. that just seems weird um i mean google starbucks uh locally talkalicious uh nice. I've, done, I've done work for every one of their restaurants i love working with those guys um yeah sfo uh, Anchor Steam, mm -hmm. but it's it's funny that I'm listening to them, but because I'm not a commercial artist, yeah, like I don't, I rarely take commercial work. So it's really when they call me, when somebody will call me up and say, "We have a really specific project, we we think you will be perfect for it." That's the way things work for, best for me because then they already want my style, they they want my eye, mm -hmm. and they want me to sort of solve their problem the way that I solve problems, mm -hmm. and that's what's most interesting to me. Like I love doing site specific work because. Like I did a 65 foot mural for Starbucks in West Portal, and I think it was was it? It's on four walls because they have like a five wall space, and it started 10 feet above from the floor. So it's a really interesting 65 feet, 10 feet above. How do you engage viewers, mm -hmm. right? And so to go in and say like, all right, how do I solve this problem? Then immediately I start thinking. That's how I compose. That's how I go out and find the site. Or SFO, where was this space? It was a five foot by 40 foot mural that was going to be in a connector hallway, which meant people were gonna be moving constantly. So, um, you know, I did something where there's, there, it's all in glass, it's in three layers. And one of the layers is, is all text, but it's printed in iridescent ink. So when you're looking at it straight on, you can't see it. But when you're moving and it catches the light, it ignites, kind of like lights turning on and off. And so because people were constantly moving, that means that it's going, this thing is going to feel this active, this otherwise stationary thing and get their attention. So it's those sort of, of unique sites of specific problems that I love to solve. I'm booking my next flight at SFO instead of Oakland now. Good. Well, you know, <laughs> give it a couple weeks because I think, I think the uh, connector officially opens to the public on the 19th. No, oh, congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. I want to ask one last question. Yeah, and please. that is what? What inspires you, or what continues to inspire you after so many pieces of artwork? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I'm, um, rather than any specific site, or what I'm motivated by is the next sort of combination of things, right? We're solving a problem, right? Like what doing, just doing a mural uh, isn't exciting. What's exciting about doing a mural is, oh, it's in that space and I have to solve that problem. And, and oh, I'm gonna work with new materials. So I learned so much, right? And it changed my process because when I when I saw when I had to fast forward and say, what's it going to look like at the end? Not exactly, right? Like, uh, but meaning, what are my materials? What do I have to do? I have to back up and say, well, step one is going to be different. Step two is going to be different from anything I've made before. And I get to apply my skills to that. And so that is inspiring to me because it keeps me fresh and it keeps me awake. Um, I love making books. Uh, so, you know, what I'm doing right now, putting these all over coffee pieces together is, you know, being able to look back and review what I've done and then write essays about it. And that really makes me think about what I was thinking about, whether those things were successful or not, whether I was pretentious or full of shit, right? Like, or what are the things that are really surprising? I'm like, wow, I didn't realize it at the time, but I made some big leaps there. And, and that and that led to this. And so it's sort of this continuum, right? It's the life's work idea that I get these ideas, I change it, I iterate, I keep changing, and and then to look back and be like, this book is going to be much different than the last one, mm -hmm. and that one was different than the one before. Just like looking at this compared to Angels, and, and, I'm, and I'm working on the third Emmett book right now, which comes out in 2023, that's called The Commissions. So I'm, I'm, I'm writing and drawing that right now as Two well. Two years later. Yeah, well the book world is slow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, we're sending all over Coffee 3 to print what in a month and it will come out summer of next year so you know this the, with the book business there's a, a long delay uh so what keeps me inspired is sort of you know doing the next project a little differently and yeah. kind of surprising myself and challenging myself very cool thank you so much for your time my pleasure thank you check out paulmadonna.com you can buy originals there you can buy prints you can buy books um and you can check out all the work yeah. Um, thank you all for watching. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification button, write some comments and questions below. We'll see you in the next video. Dan, send me an email. Send them an email. Peace. Bye.